Right. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I don't want to lose any time with Senator Leas here. He is a very busy person this time of year. Um, so thank you, everyone, for um, being able to attend this impromptu Q&A with Senator Marco Leas. Just by way of background, um, a little bit about SnowTrack before we get going. Um, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. Um, we do this by convening human service and transportation providers and planners uh, across the county um, to share the latest mobility gaps and opportunities that there are and try to work towards solving them. Um, we do lay out transportation uh, funding principles and values of like who we are about, but we uh, cannot and do not uh, take positions on state legislation. Uh, but we can, you know, uh, share those values and also um, analyze how those, uh, how certain legislation is reflected uh, in our values or our values are reflected in legislation. So um, we are excited to be able to share the information that Senator Leas has with you um, as some of the leading thought leaders in the county um, and doers, leading doers in the county. Um, and I don't, I, I think Marco is probably the best person to uh, talk about the Move Ahead Washington package. Um, he being uh, the uh, champion for the package along with Senator Saldana and Representative Fai. Um, and so with that, I think I will just go ahead and take off my share screen here and let Senator Leas take it away. One of our uh, best champions for transportation for the county, or the best champion for transportation in our county. Thank Yay, you. thanks so much, Brock, for convening uh, this group. I'm Marco Leas, a lifelong Washingtonian and a almost lifelong Snohomish County resident. I moved to Snohomish County halfway through kindergarten, although I was born at Stevens, so I guess I can claim uh, to have started my journey in Snohomish County. Um, prior to my service in the legislature, I was an elected member of the Muckleteo City Council, an alternate on the Community Transit Board of Directors, and since 2008 have been in the legislature, first in the House for six years, where I was vice chair of the House Transportation Committee, uh, and then in the Senate since 2014, where I served in the minority as the assistant ranking member on Senate Transportation, uh, took a little break for a couple of years, uh, was on the main budget committee and now back uh, since December as chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. Um, proud um, to this session be leading the charge on an historic new investment in our transportation system and really a pivot away from the way that the state has traditionally funded transportation packages, uh, focusing more on what we can do to build a broadly multimodal system um, and less on long project lists of highway projects and, and street projects, road projects throughout the state. Uh, by comparison, in 2015, Connecting Washington had over 125 projects with about 75% of the money going to new uh, expansion of our highway system. Um, our Move Ahead Washington has uh, about 30 road projects and about 25% going to expansion of the existing system, 75% going to multimodal and fix it first and um, other uh, important principles. In terms of the sort of basic architecture, it's a roughly a $17 billion proposal and it's roughly uh, pro coming from three different sources of revenue. The first is our Climate Commitment Act, which is our, new, our state's new cap and trade, cap and invest program. The proceeds of those cap and trade auctions will go to benefit uh, carbon reduction in the economy and transportation is the largest sector receiving the largest uh, amount. So that's about a third of the revenue for this package is allocating that new climate revenue to reduce emissions in the transportation sector. About a third of our revenue comes from existing resources uh, in terms of operating budget transfer of $2 billion and money from the new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act at the federal level. And then the remaining third comes from a variety of revenue new revenue mechanisms, an export fuel tax, 
and some increases in fees paid uh, in our state transportation system. There's no gas tax, which is also a departure from previous uh, packages in Move Ahead. In terms of our major categories of spending, the third of the package that comes from the Climate Commitment Act dollar uh, Climate Commitment Act dollars is tied to the purposes identified in the Climate Commitment Act. So with these resources, we're investing in new uh, and existing active transportation programs, expanding safe routes to school, expanding our bicycle pedestrian grant program, expanding the Complete Streets program at the Transportation Investment Board, as well as some new programs, a Connecting Communities Grants program to address uh, historic um, uh, historic uh, challenges, historic mistakes in our transportation system uh, to kind of reconnect marginalized communities that have been divided by infrastructure uh, decisions in the past. Uh, a new school-based bike program uh, that is targeted at trying to ensure that students in our um, marginalized communities, low-income communities have access to bikes and bike equipment and bike education so that every kid in Washington uh, can bike. Um, it, our transit programs, that's over $3 billion, uh, focused half of it on a new transit support grant program uh, that will give direct operating support to transit agencies in exchange for a uh, requirement that fares be eliminated uh, for youth 18 and under. So this is our Kids Ride Free uh, program, uh, buses also on ferries and on trains. The other half of the transit dollars are uh, to, to some discrete transit projects, more support for uh, folks with disabilities through our special needs transit grants, a new bus and bus facility grant program, uh, and increasing funding for our green uh, transit grant program, as well as a new uh, small program to help support our tribal uh, transit partners as well with some dedicated funding uh, to help in those communities. Um, alternative fuel and electrification, uh, about $500 million that we will deploy throughout the economy to electrify, electrify, electrify as much as we can. Um, another half billion to electrify four ferries and retrofit two of our existing ferries. So um, by the middle part of this decade, we hope to have six uh, electric uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid electric ferries operating on our uh, routes. It looks like Muckleteo Clinton will be the first one to get a hybrid uh, electric boat. We're excited to welcome uh, that new vessel and to reduce emissions on that route. And then a $150 million investment in a new high-speed rail link between Vancouver, BC, Seattle, and Portland, Oregon. Uh, this will help us pull down significant new federal resources um, and um, get that launched, hopefully. The remaining $11 billion of the package outside the Climate Commitment Act dollars uh, are split between a couple of big categories, uh, continuing the ferry investment, paying for part of those new ferries from um, non-climate dollars, as well as providing operating support uh, to stabilize our ferries. We've seen um, workforce shortages and operational challenges that have disrupted service, so we will restore um, the resources there to make sure that we can keep our ferries on two boat service and the levels of service people have expected. Um, of the 17 billion uh, plan, we do have 2 billion in new projects, two and a half billion in new projects, a new I-5 bridge over the Columbia River, uh, the planning and design work uh, for the US-2 trestle, which is tied to a new multimodal design. Uh, we, in the language uh, in the budget are directing the Department of Transportation to bring back a design that prioritizes multimodal solutions, including bus rapid transit on that corridor. Uh, so we really wanna make sure that we're managing um, demand and throughput on the corridor in ways that haven't been considered uh, there before. Um, a safety improvement on SR18 out in East King County, a, a freight uh, corridor that connects I-90 down south uh, that has had safety challenges and then filling in um, HOV lanes uh, down in Pierce County. Those are kind of the three or four biggest projects. And then a, a smattering of smaller ones, some in Snohomish County, um, which I would highlight um, excitement around filling in the um, swift bat lanes um, between 148th Street and Airport Road uh, as one that I'm particularly excited about a project locally, as well as um, contributing towards the widening of Bothell Way and Bothell Everett Highway so that we can bring that swift line all the way down to Bothell at some point as well. So trying to enable uh, some of the transit corridors we're seeing uh, locally. 
Um, and then we fill in some of the existing projects, um, 1.4 billion to deliver on connecting Washington uh, projects, namely, most importantly, the I-405 corridor to get stride bus rapid transit underway, also 520, 167, 509, some others, and our Marine View Drive uh, connection up in Marysville, we'll make sure that that gets delivered on time. Uh, then the other huge uh, sources of investment, $2.4 billion to deal with our fish barrier removal has been mandated by federal courts um, in respect of our tribe's uh, treaty rights to fisheries, and then $3 billion for maintenance and preservation. So significant new investments to uh, ensure that our current system is uh, operating uh, better and in a more environmentally responsible way. So those are kind of the big um, buckets of investments with a lot of sort of smaller pieces that fit into that. There's also some new policies uh, in included in the bill, like a requirement that WashDOT use complete streets planning as they uh, begin making improvements under this package and, and under the previous uh, investment packages as well. Um, some new local options for local governments um, and some other things as well that I'm, I'm probably forgetting, but a lot for Snohomish County, a lot to expand transit in our area. The transit operating grants will support Everett Transit, Community Transit. We also have included a new um, transit coordination grant program for agencies that are considering um, you know, partnership agreements to help support that as well. And I know that there's been some conversations locally, so hopefully we can support those uh, emerging partnerships too. So I'll stop there. I could keep talking forever. Would love to hear questions, comments, uh, feedback as we uh, work on this. Uh, the Senate has passed the bill. The House moved it out of committee yesterday, and we expect the House will probably take action on the package in the next week or so uh, as we approach a March 10th deadline for this legislative session. Um, why don't we start there, Marco, just in terms of the, the last steps here of this package. So the Senate passed the as I understand it, kind of the funding mechanisms, but the actual expenditures is kind of sitting there. Um, and then the house is taking up also the funding picture. How does the expend, how do all those pieces fit together in order to meet the deadline? Yeah, the Senate will pass our uh, supplemental transportation budget and the funding bill to go with move ahead on Friday. The house is expected to take those uh, that body of work up on Saturday. And so um, we will then go to conference on the spending side. And then early next week, it sounds like the House will take up the revenue measure um, and we'll go to conference on that. And so then we'll have about a week of conference work to iron out the, there's not a lot of big differences between the House and Senate on this, but um, the small differences will iron out in conference and be on track to pass it all by March 10th and finish the task. Um, well, before I kick to everybody, I just want to highlight um, the doubling of the special needs transit grants, uh, which is huge for a lot of the providers that Snowtrack is, uh, works with, um, as well as the funding for the tribal transit grants, which is a whole new grant program. Um, so there's, I think, about 70 million per biennium for, or oh, let me get this, yeah, per biennium for the special needs transit grants and about 13, a little over 13 per biennium for the tribal transit grant. So um, I think a lot of our nonprofit providers will be really interested in both of those programs. Um, all right, uh, let's kick it over to folks who have questions. It looks like Tom Hinkson, director of Everett Transit has the first question. So what is the timeline for agencies to adopt free youth fare in order to qualify for the new revenue? We are trying to push out uh, some of the new transit uh, support grants as soon as possible. Um, so I'm expecting the department by the fall should be able to push out the first tranche of those transit operating grants. And it is a, an element of qualifying for those grants. So I would expect if the department can push those dollars out by fall, that it would go to agencies that have been able to make the, the fair uh, policy change by then. We'll have more of the exact details. Um, as the department begins to implement, but um, that's the current vision. Obviously, some agencies like Island Transit already qualify because they don't charge uh, fares to youth. Uh, our state ferries will shift over on October 1st and Sound Transit, uh, we've set a target of October 1st for them as well. 
Um, so hopefully by this fall, um, as everyone's making their fair policy adjustments, I, I don't know exactly how each agency does it. I know that there's typically sort of times of the year when you look at those fair policies, we hope you'll fold it in. Great. Um, Chris and Kinnaman with Sharing Wheels, um, a community bike shop and bikes club of Snohomish County. Uh, as, uh, there was a project, the, the North Everett Broadway pedestrian bridge that connects Everett Community College to uh, WCU Everett is in the package, I think 40 some million, if I remember right. Um, it, there's obviously some projects that are listed that weren't in the state wide tip or the regional tip, which uh, generally those the, the projects on those lists already have some sort of federal funding, which is why they end up on those lists. Um, there's a few other projects I could think of that I hadn't seen before, um, but uh, I know some of them were within the counties and SKIPS, uh, the Snohomish uh, County Committee for Improved Transportation's priorities. Um, can you talk a little bit how uh, projects were picked up and um listed uh you know i would say probably most projects on the bike ped side aren't listed uh that they'll be programmatic but to the extent some some were listed how were they picked yeah some of them are are legacies from uh, previous proposals there was a forward washington proposal in the past that some of the projects came from uh, that North Broadway pedestrian bridge came from the city of Everett as well as Everett Community College uh, as they're trying to sort of continue to build out the um, kind of higher ed district in, on North Broadway. Uh, that's been sort of a linchpin. Um, the college is building their new um, kind of library and learning resource building on the east side of Broadway. And so having a really strong pedestrian connection was important uh, to them uh, for that reason. So it was sort of a shared request from the two of them. Um, other projects, SR99 revitalization is continuing work. Um, so we're sort of building on that, uh, that we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, I'm trying to look at the list in front of me to see some of the other highlights. And then we of course expect that um, a lot, a lot, a lot of projects will qualify through the dramatic expansions in safe routes and bicycle pedestrian grant programs. And so, that those are gonna be the predominant ways that we direct folks to get funded uh, moving forward is to look through those lenses um, because there's gonna be some, I mean, I, I think with Safe Routes, we're essentially doubling the lifetime funding for Safe Routes to date. We are now doubling all the funding that's ever been put into that by state government um, in the next 16 years, which is a huge and exciting expansion. So um, yeah, that's how those came to be. Um. We, th there's a question that I got, um, and I've been uh, seeing this play out within the House Transportation Committee this week, especially um, regarding other states not being thrilled about having uh, our gas tax reframed within the package, uh, such that um, we characterize the, uh, that we're not taxing out of state uh, <laughs> uh, exports uh, when we're exporting to out of state um except for six cents now and so it's being characterized as the six cent export tax um and how do you think some of those things are going to play out in terms of both the the politics the the risk of funding towards uh highway projects uh, since that funding is going towards highway projects uh primarily and um just the effect that some of the, the the tailoring towards the end of this decision, the the committee, the house committee's uh, work, is going to shrink back some of the revenue. I don't know if it's going to be significant, but uh, will shrink back some of the revenue uh, because some of the fees are being rolled back. Yeah, you know, um, it's part of the reason why I think we're going to need to go to conference is to sort of iron out the details between the house and senate approaches. And uh, you know, we spent some time on the front end. Um, with our House and Senate negotiating teams agreeing on a shared proposal to bring forward. And I think it makes sense for us to regroup at the end of the process and kind of knit the two approaches together. Um, the export tax, we have um, a number of refineries in Washington that have impacts on their local communities and have impacts on the, uh, the global uh, carbon landscape. And so 
Um, I felt really strongly that it is fair to uh, ensure that these refineries are, are paying for the social costs of carbon uh, that they emit into our shared environment, as well as for the you know, more localized impacts they have on the communities that they're located in. So the mechanism we're using is that uh, export fuel tax. Um, and you know, I think there's been a lot of debate and discussion about um, the merits of it. Nobody wants to pay new taxes, um, but I do think that these refineries have real impacts in our state and it's fair for us to ask for mitigation and invest that into you know, what is a, a pivotal approach that's shifting us away from a fossil fuel based economy towards a clean electrified transportation system moving forward. Um, so uh, the other fees, you know, we'll take a look at what they did. We'll iron it together and make sure that it's a balanced, uh, that the, the revenue matches with the spending um, and that it is sustainable into the long term. Um. We have a question from Eddie Lowe. Uh, thanking you for your leadership and incredible new transportation package work. Um, can you expand the TDM program? So the Transportation Demand Management Program. Um, and I assume the intent here is also the commute trip reduction program that's tied into that. Yeah, and there's a little bit, um, a little bit more into that um, about, I guess, not quite $2 million a year, but some expansion of of that work uh, over the course of the package. Um, clearly we have more uh, work to do in that regard. I also, part of the reason why we provide the transit support grant revenue uh, with, you know, other than the fare free for kids, um, there's really no other strings attached. So that'll empower our transit agencies as they're doing critical TDM work uh, to deploy these resources as appropriate as well. And I know um, just to pick on our local folks, I know that Community Transit's doing some innovative pilots around kind of micro mobility in Linwood to see uh, some approaches that might work there. And so, you know, my vision is that we give our transit agencies flexible funding and they can kind of tailor solutions to local contexts um, and, you know, pair that with some CTR credits and some designated funding. In the past, the legislature wanted to like program every dollar into a little bucket. I'd like to see us provide more flexible funding because we really do want uh, transit agencies to be able to do all of the above uh, approaches at the local level. And to the extent we can provide flexible funds, we can get um, win-wins on all of that stuff. We've got four minutes left. So um, if so, nobody has gone on camera yet, turn themselves off mute and ask a question directly to Sandra Leah. So if you would like to do that, now is your time. Um, I would like to just highlight something you highlighted, Senator Leas, which I think is really great, lines up with Snowtrax values around safety, which is the new complete streets requirement towards projects over 500,000 um, and taking a safe systems approach on those projects, which means we're gonna engineer streets to be a little bit uh, more forgiving and accommodating for uh, more people. Um, and I think it's a really great step forward for safety. Um, the Also the, the transit program is revolutionary, I think. Uh, I'm sure Tom and Roland who are here with Everett Transit and Community Transit um, are, are really excited about the funding opportunity, maybe a little bit nervous about uh, trying to get uh, the approval for free fares uh, for 18 and under, um, just through their boards and through the city council. But um, I think could be re it really lines up with the mission of making sure that uh, more people have access to transit and, and younger folks can get around, uh, folks who generally don't drive as much. So, um, yeah, hey. it, it is very rare. I think only, um, I guess probably for about a decade in the nineties, uh, the state provided some direct operating support. And then briefly during the great recession, there was about a two year period that the state provided operating support to transits. Otherwise it's been, the regional mobility grant program or some of these sort of categorical programs. I really believe if we're gonna have a 21st century transit system in this state that we need to really up our game in terms of direct operating support to our transit agencies uh, to deliver high quality service. And it's gonna look different in different communities. You know, The needs of Everett and Linwood are different than the needs of Wenatchee 
uh, and Leavenworth. And so when we provide flexible funding, um, then agencies can really tailor to meet those unique local needs. Um, and I, I have a, a suspicion when the board sees the full uh, scope of what 16 years times this grant program means, a, a case of community transit over $100 million of new funding, I suspect that that uh, small and modest uh, revenue impact from the youth fairs uh, will pale in comparison. I also think we'll induce a lot of demand if we do this right, especially if you look at the plans at, at community and Everett to align to light rail deployment. I think getting our youth to think about how they can connect to light rail as soon as that opens is just going to change behavior patterns uh, into the future. And it aligns with sort of our shared vision of kind of getting people to think transit first rather than uh, as an afterthought. So excited to see how it all works out. Um, well, we're really close to time here. Um, we did have one more question here instead of another question for me. Um, we have one from Dan Hoyt of, around <laughs> high-speed rail and uh, how the money would be invested. And I know there's a couple of different philosophies of, of how to invest money within high-speed rail. So I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on how that money we spend. I mean, we need an all of the above approach. You know, we need light rail, we need sounder, we need cascades, and then we need high-speed rail um all overlaid on top of each other each of them has a constraint and so they sort of work together as a network to meet the needs of the region into the future the new high-speed rail dollars really are designed uh, to create uh, the systems that we've seen in in europe and asia that are you know in that 200 mile an hour range that make a trip between seattle and vancouver an hour um, and that'll take, you know, just like Sound Transit has taken us from 1996 to now to get to Linwood, it'll take us some time to construct that system. But that will be an overlay, not to compete with uh, existing rail, but really to compete with auto and, and air traffic. Um, this, there's a significant number of people that fly between Seattle and Portland and Seattle and Vancouver at great emissions uh, impacts. And so we'd like to really bring those trips into an electrified format. The same, a lot of people traveling by car uh, between these cities. And so we'd like to, um, if a car takes you three hours and a train takes you an hour, um, you know, that's gonna be competitive in a way that'll get people to change behavior. So that's the vision there. We definitely want more Amtrak Cascade service in the meantime. Um, I think the constraint on Cascades is we're operating on Burlington Northern right of way. So we can't really reach the 200 mile per hour goal on a, on a rail line that's dedicated to freight that passenger rail is sort of operating as a, a secondary use. So we've got to layer these things in together. And when you look at, you know, what Madrid has done or Paris has done or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, cities in Asia, you really see an intersection between all of these tools working together uh, to compel and propel mobility. Um, and then the IT sector between our three cities, if you look at the common thread, um, there is an information technology workforce between Vancouver, Seattle, and Portland that becomes really nicely linked by uh, high-speed rail in a way that will continue to propel us to be competitive as a regional economy moving forward. So um, I, it's about 1% of the, of the total package. I, I think we can spend 1% imagining a better future uh, for ourselves uh, and for future generations, and then we'll spend the other 99% making today as great as possible for everybody that lives in the region. That's it. Well, thank you so much, Senator Elias. Um, good luck in your final uh, week and a half, two weeks or so here. Um, and uh, we'll check in uh, towards the end or after session. Yeah, well, we can do even more than a half hour then because we'll yeah, exactly. you know, be living, living large after session's over. So thanks, everybody. It's good to see so many friends. Uh, thanks for all your work locally. Uh, hopefully we can bring some resource to help you all uh, make some real progress uh, in Sonoma County to help us connect our communities in better ways. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.